necessary to ensure the filling of the Spirit for the only way to understand and to assimilate the infallible Word of God. You have, therefore, those few moments of privacy of your priesthood for rebound, if necessary, otherwise, to prepare yourself for concentrating on what the Word has to teach us this evening. Let us pray. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for the privilege and the opportunity of fellowshipping in the Word. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will take the things that we study and make them a source of blessing and challenge. For we ask it in Christ's name, Amen. We're still holding that thought. Turn to Psalm, Psalm 37, 23. While you're turning there, I've tried to get an accurate count on how much time we have spent on the unique spiritual life of the church age. And I've had several different uh, reports, and I think we now have an accurate one. As of this evening, 1 April 1998, 1,263 hours on spiritual dynamics, or the doctrine of the unique spiritual life of the church age. Psalm 37, 23. This is a very interesting psalm for several reasons. First of all, it has an interpretation. Then it is used as an illustration and application. The interpretation belongs to Israel. The illustration and application belongs even to us. And even there is the shadow of eschatology over some of the verses that are found in Psalm 37. The psalm is generally translated correctly as it was originally penned from David under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. The language, therefore, is uh, filled with anthropopathisms and analogy. It begins with the steps of a man. And, of course, the steps of a man here, steps has to do with lifestyle, quality of life. What kind of a life do you live? You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have received him as your personal Savior. You're going to spend all eternity with him. He provided from the time of David a spiritual life for Israel. Application, he has provided even a far, far greater spiritual life for us in this church age. It's the word man that is very important to understand because it is not the ordinary word for man in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it looks like this, and that would be G-E-B-E-R, Geber. And Geber is a warrior. Geber is a person who overcomes obstacles and problems. Geber is a person uh, who is at his most competent and capable level. In other words, Geber is a hero a winner believer here, and uh, it says that the steps of a man, a winner believer, male or female, are established by the Lord, or it can be translated from the Lord. In fact, that's closer to the preposition, main, the main preposition in the Hebrew. So we begin by noting that from this point, we're talking about winner believers in a different dispensation. But there are certain things that winter believers in every dispensation have in common. They have Bible doctrine. They have Bible doctrine circulating in the stream of consciousness. They have metabolized that Bible doctrine. They now live by problem-solving devices. In this case, the winter believer here is occupied with the person of Christ as it existed in relationship to the revelation of the Old Testament. In the next verse, verse 24, when he falls, now we're talking about a winter believer. We're talking about a believer who has maxed out the spiritual life. He's in a Jeshurun status, or at least spiritual maturity and going in that direction. 
when he falls, speaking of the post-salvation spiritual life, and in this case, carnality or post-salvation sin. So it's the same in all dispensations, even with the, those who are the closest to being on top as far as the spiritual life is concerned, they still fail from time to time. In fact, the temptations are more subtle and even greater as you advance in the spiritual life. And the distractions, likewise, they are very subtle, and therefore many persons are almost to the place of total winner hero status, invisible hero, and then, of course, they lose out. David almost lost out on several occasions himself, and he's the writer of this psalm. And he says, when he falls, he shall not be utterly cast out. This is the hafel imperfect of the verb tol or tool, which looks like this in the Hebrew. That would be T-U-L in transliteration. And in the hafel stem, that is passive voice, and uh, it has a concept of the of failure, complete failure, at the wrong time. He shall not be cast forth. He isn't through just because he failed. This is the principle of rebound. And why is this true? Here is a believer who is advancing to the high ground, and at the same time he sins, he fails, a reminder that we all have a sin nature, and that the sin nature works over time as we get closer to the final objective, which in this case of David would be Jeshurun. When he falls, he shall not be cast out. Why? Because the Lord is the one who holds his hand, or holds him by his hand. In other words, it is the fact of eternal security. And the fact that he is still alive after such a failure, whatever it was in this case, the emphasis is on rebound, which is the same in every dispensation. So by interpretation, we're talking about rebound in a previous dispensation. We're talking about the fact that even though he has failed, he can recover his spiritual life through the same principle that we have in 1 John 1, 9. But that isn't all. Being held by the Lord's hand is also the doctrine of eternal security. John 10, 28, where Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. In the next verse, Psalm 25, of, uh, verse 25 of Psalm 37, I have been young, and now I am old. This is David's testimony. He has now come to the place where he has lived a very long time. And he now, from this point on, his observations are made from the standpoint of one who has been graced out by the Lord to live far longer than expected. And I think that's the way with many who reach that point. I am the first member of my family to live to be 80 years old as I am today. My father died at 65. His brother, my uncle, died at 63. And the men of the family just did not live that long in past generations. And the fact that I did not even anticipate living this long. In fact, in World War II, I wasn't sure I was going to live at long at all. But I recognize once again the principle that long life, is nothing unless there is a quality factor. And the quality factor must depend upon the values. If you live without the values that are found in the Word of God, you do not have any quality to your life. Your quali the quality is gone. It isn't there. And therefore, whatever comes your way, often discipline, sometimes testing, but anything that comes along, you can't handle it. And you are miserable 90% of the time in your life. And so there isn't really anything there. And what does it mean if you live to be 80 or 100 or 110, and all you are is miserable all that time? And what are the factors that go into this? Bitterness. Bitterness being the greatest sin of arrogance, along with the other sins that flow from it, they're also sins of emotion. Bitterness, jealousy, vindictiveness, implacability, hatred. And then you start in on the function of the arrogance skills. The first, of course, being self-justification. One of the things that is a sign of unhappiness is the person who is always explaining why they are right and never wrong. 
There are certain people in life that have no quality to their life simply because they're always trying to prove they're right. And there's no such thing as any of us always being right. And the standards by which we determine these things is found in the Word of God, and we deal with them in the privacy of our priesthood because you will note that it says in this passage, I have been young, and now I am old. And then he says, uh, so he's going to add to this. But most people, when they have lived a long time, they think that's a great thing. And frankly, I wouldn't think it was a great thing if your lifestyle is one of perpetual carnality and you're under divine discipline, you're under self-induced misery, you spend your life making friends, and we will study this as a part of what is to be learned from holding that thought, but we will study that because you have a tendency, you make your friends in a very simple way. You put them on a pedestal, and here they are on a pedestal. And you glorify them, and you are, you're occupied with them, and your spiritual life goes to hell in a handbasket. Down, down, down. And you don't have any quality to your life. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are in a state of emotion. Now, you're going to find out a very interesting thing. The love that God has for us has no emotion. We have studied the love of God very recently. We reviewed it. And one of the attributes that we noted, besides the fact that God, God's love is not filled with any silliness or anything of that sort, is that, there, that it is without emotion. It is on a higher plane. It's on the highest possible quality. And that is thought. Oh, emotion is always a responder for us. And God gave us emotion. But he never gave us emotion for the quality of our life. The quality of our life must come from thinking, Bible doctrine circulating in the stream of consciousness. Where does emotion seem to have its biggest function in our life? It has to do with entertainment. Entertainment is usually designed to for emotion. And as a matter of fact, this is why the Greeks invented tragedy, so that they could use emotion as a system of cleansing out the soul. But in so doing, they also destroyed and were distracted from the very things that solve all of the problems of adversity, trials, heartaches, disasters, everything that is painful in life. And therefore, there is this concept of putting someone on a pedestal. You put your friends on a pedestal. Now, as soon, and as soon as that pedestal is occupied in your soul, you immediately have a big distraction for the spiritual life or a potentially large distraction. And the reason is because this, what you have created, is simply a, an idol. You have created an idol, and you have created an idol with an old sin nature. And you do not see the old sin nature, otherwise you would not have been attracted to such a person as a friend or as a, a lover or whatever it is. And then one day you see the feet of clay, and here they are. And when you see the feet of clay, you react. And you react, therefore, with arrogance and emotion. And the emotion gives you irrationality, and the arrogance gives you the bitterness, the, the vindictiveness, the jealousy, whatever it happens to be, so that the very idol that you have created, you now destroy it. And that you end up with great antagonism and hatred toward that person, and even malice, the lust to hurt someone who has made you unhappy. But who really made you unhappy? I can tell you very simply who made you unhappy. You made yourself unhappy. They had nothing to do with it. They were just a, a person walking by, and you just grab them and put them on a pedestal. And to the extent that you do that, you are demonstrating that you have no quality to your life because your concept of love and attraction is based on the overt, and there is no true love in your soul. And the whole point of the spiritual life of the church age that makes it unique is agape. There it is. A-G-A-P-E. God has in his integrity not only righteousness and justice, 
but he has love. And love comes to the forefront. And that is what is so important about this passage. And that is what is so important about this concept. Here it is. We haven't, we haven't finished with it. We have just really begun. Here is the righteousness of God, the justice of God, and the love of God. You can't see the righteousness and justice of God in this particular uh, one because you see the, they're very, very lightly shaded in. To see it all, you have to see it this way. What the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God executes through the love of God as expressed in the grace of God. That's the general modus operandi of the integrity of God. Now here we have the concept of divine love in a very special way. And this is one of the principles that we need to understand before we get cracking again with our thought. And that is the fact that divine love is a part of the integrity of God and twice in, only twice in human history, as we will note this evening, love has had a very special place as the point of contact for Adam and Isha, Isha being the Hebrew word for woman. Later on she was called Eve, Kufa, but here she is Isha. And they were in a state of perfection and in a state of innocence and love was their point of contact. And when the original sin of Adam and the original sin of the woman was committed from that point and then for the rest of human history, the point of contact is the justice of God. And that, of course, lines up perfectly with the concept we have studied so many times that the righteousness of God condemned all sins in eternity past and that the justice of God, therefore, the judge those sins, what the righteousness of God demands in condemnation, the judge, the justice of God judges, and he imputed all those sins to Christ on the cross and judged every one of them. The cross is the greatest courtroom scene in all of history. And the love of God is the solution. And the love of God is expressed very simply. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. In other words, here is the solution to the judgment of the justice of God, and it comes from love as expressed in the grace of God, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that's salvation, but it is the post-salvation spiritual life of the church age that gives us the most fantastic life that could ever exist, and how long you live is not the issue. What is really the true issue is what is the quality of your life, and the quality of your life depends upon on your spiritual life and the quality of your life depends on true love in the soul which I've been in the process of slowly but surely defining for you bit by bit yard by yard line upon line and precept upon precept and now for the only time in history the only time it was a point of love was the point of contact was when Adam and the woman were perfect and love could be the point of contact. And because they were absolutely perfect, they were absolutely innocent, they didn't even know what sin was. They only had one prohibition. They only had one way they could sin. And they finally took it, of course. And that was the end of it. Then justice, the, the justice of God in divine integrity became the point of contact all the way to the end of human history. It is now and always will be. But there is a point of reference, and the point of reference is the love of God. And the love of God, point of reference, has to do with the, not with people as such, but with something, with a present that God gave us at salvation, every one of us, when he gave us among the 39 irrevocable absolutes, our very own portfolio of invisible asset, assets, and page one is our spiritual life with our name on it. Now, that the point of reference then is the unique operational type spiritual life of the church age and from whence did it come what is its source it came from the prototype spiritual life executed by the unique humanity of jesus christ in hypostatic union and it is a unique spiritual life he executed it in perfection he was perfect from the virgin birth he was perfect throughout his lifetime, even though he was tested far beyond anything we will ever face, and far greater pressure. Now he says here, here's where we get the first principle. In Psalm 37, 25, I have been young, and now I am old. Now the question is, the first thing that you say to that in the time in which you live, so what? This is a scripture. That means, therefore, that it's more than simply so what? 
It is a fact of life that the only true living that you ever do is the quality living as a believer in Jesus Christ that comes from the unique spiritual life. Now, you can't spend your whole life being entertained. And those of you who spend your whole life concentrating on entertainment, you will never have a spiritual life. You'll always be distracted. And there's something far greater. There is sharing the happiness of God. And sharing the happiness of God is strictly thinking. It isn't emotion at all. We always associate uh, happiness with emotion. Wrong. It is just exactly the opposite. That's why we have the thinking of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, the translation, which ends up by saying we have, not the mind of Christ, we have the thinking of Christ. And the thinking of Christ is Bible doctrine. And the quality of our life depends entirely upon each one of us as an individual. And every one of you sitting here tonight as a believer in Jesus Christ in the dispensation of the church, you have the same equal privilege and equal opportunity to have this magnificent quality of life. So the fact that I have lived for 80 years is not really an issue to me. People ask me, how do I feel when I'm 80? Well, I don't feel any different, except I notice that I felt much worse when I was 40, and that's about it. I feel fine. I, that, it doesn't bother me. I, I feel great. I guess everyone expected me that as soon as I hit 80, I start feeling aches and pains and start limping around and so on. No, I feel fine. That's not the point. The only thing that counts is not how I feel, how I think. Do I think in terms of Bible doctrine? Do I deploy and use the problem-solving devices on the plot line of the soul? Do I have the peace of God that passes all understanding, garrison my heart and mind, my thinking? That's the thing that counts. Do I have true love? Do I have love which is in the soul? The love which it combines with two marvelous concepts. Two concepts come together. And one of them, of course, is love. And this is an offshoot from divine love. And the other is respect. And whatever direction it goes, the two must always stay together. When they separate, each destroys the other. In that, of course, lack of respect, and you have the iconoclastic arrogance, and the feet of clay syndrome, and the other way around, you have all, and the lack of love, and you have all of the bitterness all of the vindictiveness, implacability, the hatred, the revenge motivation, the revenge modus operandi, everything that makes your quality of life miserable. And these are things that believers face constantly. And yet we have the greatest spiritual life in all of human history so that we do not have to go to the arrogance skills. And we do not have to have self-justification. This idea that your life is ruined. I know people and I see people and I've lived with around people who every time you're around them, if they, if they are wrong and you say they are wrong and they can't prove they're right, they're ready for suicide almost or to wring your neck. That is arrogance. So what? And then, of course, you go to self-deception from there. And self-deception means, well, after you've been miserable because in your arrogance you have to always be right, you have to start deceiving yourself to say that you're always right. And as soon as you start deceiving yourself and saying that you're always right, the next thing you know, you're lying to yourself. You're always right and you're perfect almost and, and everyone else is wrong. And, and now you're in self-deception. And once you're in self-deception, then you move into the concepts of lying about others. You lie to yourself, and then you lie about others. And you lie about others because you're in conflict with everyone else in your periphery. Everyone. And you are the most miserable of people, and you're a born-again believer, and as an ambassador for Christ, you're a flop. But that's only part of it, because you're also under divine discipline. And you are sowing to the tornado and you are reaping the whirlwind. And you say, 
You go, you come here, and we've had people to do it, and they come here and say, well, Bible doctrine doesn't work. I'm going to go try something else. Oh, well, Bible doctrine works. You just don't know what you're doing. Your lifestyle is so bad, and you have rejected Bible doctrine. You're in a state of reversionism. That's all. So it isn't how long you live. It's the quality of your life. And the spiritual life was designed from the moment that you were born again to have nothing but the greatest quality in life. So this is why David finally comes to saying, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous. And sadik is the Hebrew word here, and it refers to experiential sanctification or the execution of the spiritual life. Righteous is simply used as a word, a key word in the Old Testament especially here, for the execution of the spiritual life, not self-righteousness. This is the righteousness that comes from this lifestyle, this fantastic, wonderful spiritual life. And therefore, the experiential sanctification, the righteousness of the spiritual life, becomes very important because it refers to the execution of the spiritual life given in any dispensation post-salvation spiritual life. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Post-salvation spiritual life. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken. In other words, if you have this lifestyle and if you're living this spiritual life, you are never forsaken by God or his descendants begging bread, blessing by association with an invisible hero. And then in verse 28, For the Lord loves justice. Now we have to go back to the integrity of God and see something we have not noticed, or I haven't emphasized it enough, for you to understand this. We talk so much about how love has to line up with righteousness and justice. Here is where love loves justice. It goes the other way as well. The love of God loves the justice of God. And the, and the justice of God also the righteousness of God. Now what does this mean? It means that there is therefore not simply judgment, but there are other factors. When the righteousness of God approves, remember that righteousness and love work together, and the righteousness of God approves of something, then it demands that the justice of God bless. And the justice of God then sends the blessing because that's the point of contact. And it sends the blessing to the believer through the love of God as expressed in the grace of God. And so this reverses. We think of it going this way, but it goes back the other way as well. And that's stated in this principle right here. It goes both ways. The integrity of God works two ways. And the love of God is not only a part of the integrity of God and always has been, but if anything, it is paramount. Why? The love of God was the first manifestation of the integrity of God to the human race. and was only withdrawn as the point of contact because of sin. And the justice of God judges sin because the righteousness of God condemns sin. And the love of God, in this case, can only provide the solution to sin, which is salvation. For God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son that anyone who believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. And so here's the illustration of the believer who has, doesn't say how long David lived, but there's one thing that's very clear. He had, he, he committed some rather surprising, but uh, not uh, necessarily shocking. They were great sins, and he, uh, he was disciplined for them. We don't have to worry about that. People are always worried about David. I think you better worry more about yourself. When people start worrying about David, I began to suspect that they have a big stripe of yellow stripe of legalism running down their back and they're losers all the way. And here it is. I have been young and now I'm old and yet 
I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants, next generation, begging bread. Why? Blessing by association with an invisible hero. Someone who has cracked the maturity barrier and gone all the way, in this case, <clears throat> to Deshurin. Now in verse 28, For the Lord loves justice. What does that mean? That means that since the fall of our original parents, the original sin, that love <clears throat> and justice also reverse. And the Lord loves justice. Both justice and love are the divine attributes and divine integrity. And love says to justice, bless them. The righteousness of God approves. And love says to justice, bless them. And blessing comes that way. So here's where you have a situation where the love of God says this believer is executing the spiritual life, this believer is growing, and, and therefore love tells justice, bless them, and the righteousness of God concurs because this is the principle of the righteousness of God. These believers are executing. That's why righteousness is used as a synonym for executing the spiritual life. This isn't the righteousness of the Mosaic law. Now we're talking about the application. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. Who are the godly ones? Well, those are the believers who have advanced to maturity or are moving along and also can be used for believers simply because they're believers and be translated even saints. And God does not forsake his saints. Every believer is a saint set apart from, to God at the moment of salvation. And notice that's what is stated thereafter. They are preserved forever. You cannot lose your salvation because you're a failure. There is no way. It is the quintessence of human arrogance to think that you can commit a sin that shocks you, whatever it is, and cancel your salvation. Who do you think you are? You have eternal life. It's irrevocable. Whoever gave you the idea that no matter what terrible things you have done as a believer, that you can lose your salvation. You have the worst locked-in arrogance that ever existed. Who are you? You're a failure all the way. Your arrogance is beyond description. It's satanic. You cannot cancel the irrevocable absolutes given to you at salvation. Somebody should have told you that before you believed. So you could die and go to hell and have a few moments of peace before you went. And the last few. What's the matter with you? 39 irrevocable absolutes at salvation. You cannot cancel your salvation. Once you believe in Christ, you receive them. And the word irrevocable should help you. And the word absolute should help you. You have eternal life. You will always have eternal life. Eternal life means relationship with God, not eternal condemnation. You have the righteousness of God. You will always have the righteousness of God. If you're going to live with God forever, you have to have his life, eternal life, and you have to have his righteousness. And you do. You have his righteousness, and you have his eternal life. How dare you even think or allow any clergyman or any system of religion to tell you that you have committed a sin that cancels out any possibility of salvation. What vile blasphemy that is. That isn't the grace of God at all. And people who live under that system have no quality to their life at all. They are slaves to religion. And religion belongs to Satan. And it's always a system of works. And for every time that you said you have to work your way out of that one, you have to do something for the church, whatever it is, one little church with a steeple or a large system or denomination. It's a terrible system of evil. The moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you received irrevocable absolutes, 39 of them. We've studied them. And you have the colossal 
arrogance to think that you can cancel them because you have done some terrible thing. And I might agree that you've done some terrible thing, but you haven't canceled them. You can't. Oh, you can, You probably will wind up a, a second in a very poor standing as far as eternity is concerned in your resurrection body. You'll be embarrassed. You'll be in shame at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, but you have eternal life and you have eternal salvation. And you're going to live with God forever. You're not going to live in the lake of fire. I don't know where you get these ideas. You don't get them from the Word of God. And this is not an encouragement to sin. Every time you think, oh, that's good, I'm going to go out and sin. Goodbye, God, I'll see you in eternity. You just forget one thing. What the righteousness of God demands by way of punishment, the justice of God executes. And whom the Lord loves, he skins the life of the whip, he punishes. It's a family matter. And you will rue the day that you sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind. You don't get away with anything. But by the same token, you have not lost your relationship with God. I used to, I've done one or two things in my life when I was a boy that uh, certainly uh, warranted uh, shocking my parents. And I was dragged uh, once or twice to the front door Never the back door. I was always praying, back door, please. <laughs> but it was always the front door. My father was always, his, his study was very close to the front door. And he could come to the front door, and he could see me, and he could see someone holding me by the ear, or some by the arm or something, and, and he was, uh, they were about to enucleate my sins. My father already knew them, and he always gave me one quick look. It was just a quick glance, but I read it. I learned to read it. Well, he is my son, but I could just see the wheels going around. But I wish to hell right now he wasn't. <laughs> but I was his son, and always will be his son. Bobby's my son, he always will be my son. No matter what he does, he's still my son. And that can never change, even as it was with my father. So how do you think that your heavenly father is going to kick you out just because you've sinned? You are mixed up. And that is a distraction. It's a distraction in antithesis to another thing that destroys your lifestyle. And what is the other thing that destroys your lifestyle? Entertainment. Too much entertainment. You've got to be entertained all the time. Entertainment is your life. And you'll never, you'll never advance in the spiritual life by sin, and you'll never advance by bitterness in life, and you'll never advance if you make entertainment your number one project. Entertainment is nice for all of us on occasion. But to make it the source of our thinking in our life is terrible. How do I know that? I grew up in the entertainment capital of the world, Beverly Hills, California. And I never saw so many miserable people in all my life. I never saw an entertainer that was happy very long. They would be emotionally way up here if they held in their hands some idiot idol, which they worshipped, called Oscar. That's about what they ought to call it, too. My father used to laugh at that stuff. He said, that's the craziest stuff in the world. Imagine beating their brains out all that just to get that. And what's that? That's the approbation center. Now all come and worship the one who holds Oscar. That's, you know what I mean? Does that sound like, make sense to you? Well, it makes sense to a lot of stupid people. But that's not it. Quality of life? Let me tell you. There were some wonderful, wonderful people in Beverly Hills, but they were the ones who were not in the entertainment business, or the ones who were, had such a marvelous sense of humor that they laughed at all of this stuff, never took it seriously. But the ones who took it seriously would, get, would get, go out and shoot themselves, they would, live, they would die young because they uh, drank themselves to death because they, they missed a line somewhere and everybody thought that was the worst thing. It's a terrible life if you get into that kind of a mess. Now, that doesn't mean we're all going to get in the same kind of a mess. I've given you three little messes here. You have your pit. But there are more than three. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have seen the righteous, never seen, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, or his seed begging bread. And that means his descendants. Blessing by association. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. And godly means 
sanctification. It also, it means set apart unto God. It also can be translated saints in the sense that all believers are saints. All right, let's get cracking now. Well, we won't have much time, but we can get a start on this. Since the original sin of Adam and Eshaw, divine justice is the point of contact. That you remember. Divine justice was only the point of contact in the Garden of Eden. So let's put it on the board again so you'll remember it. There it is. However, God continues to love all believers, carnal or spiritual, even though divine justice is the point of contact. That's the issue. Repeat. God continues to love all believers, carnal or spiritual, even though divine justice is the point of contact. And divine justice is the source by which love or righteousness, or in both actually, say, bless this person, bless this group, provide blessing here. And the justice of God, being the point of contact, not only judges, but blesses. Blessing and justice come out of the same faucet. However, in the dispensation of the church, divine love is more than that. Divine love is the point of reference as part of the unique spiritual life of the church age. So, point of reference. Reference means to direct attention to something important, something of personal interest. Reference means recourse for the purpose of information. Reference means to endorse a person or a course of action or both. The point of reference for the church age, amazingly enough, is the love of God. The love of God. The love of God as part of God's integrity. And the point of reference from the love of God directs attention to something important. The unique spiritual life of the church age. Point of reference from the love of God provides something of personal interest. Our spiritual life reduced to writing in the New Testament canon of Scripture, Bible doctrine. Therefore, point of reference means both access and recourse to the infallible Word of God plus accurate Bible teaching from the gift of pastor-teacher. That's what should be. That's often missing, I'm sorry to report. Point of reference endorses a course of action related to divine love as an integral part of the integrity of God. The point of reference of love is for the dispensation of the church only. Therefore, a simple analogy. Just as divine love was the point of contact one time in the Garden of Eden, so also divine love is the point of reference one time in the church age only. You have something that never existed before and will never exist after the resurrection of the church. The love of God then, it was the point of contact in the Garden of Eden as long as our original parents, Adam and Esau, remained in the state of perfection and innocence. And the original sin of Adam and Eve changed the point of contact from the love of God to the justice of God for the rest of human history. It's still that way today, and it will be that way to the end of the millennium. Not until the dispensation of the church did the love of God become a point of reference for the unique spiritual life of the church age and only for the church age? Therefore, we have something very special built around the love of God, and it's related to the love of God in the soul. Very important. When people talk about, I love you, they're talking about your place or mine. That type of thing. And that isn't love at all. That's lust. That's entertainment, that's desire, whatever it is. It is not happiness. And it's not lifestyle that has any quality. And yet the world's going mad over it. Sex is not love. They talk about sexual love, it's their contradictory terms. That's an oxymoron. Love is in the soul. Sex, good sex in marriage, is a result of true love. But to put love and sex together is a farce. The Bible doesn't put, do that. And so people are all mixed up all the way through. No wonder so many people, the Christians, are falling by the wayside. It's simply because 
they think you have to have some great emotional stimulation, whether it's sex or something else, or drugs, or uh, drink alcohol, or whatever. And they think that's happiness, and that's, that isn't a lifestyle of anything. And the tragedy is people do not understand the source, and when you do not go to the source, you have nothing. You have a lot of superficialities with no anchor to them, nothing to give them quality. So, not until the dispensation of the church did the love of God become the point of reference for the unique spiritual life of the church age. And the reason for this fact that divine love is the point of reference for the church age only can be attributed directly to the prototype spiritual life of executed by the human nature of Jesus Christ in hypostatic union. Jesus Christ had the highest quality of life ever. He wasn't unhappy. He had a marvelous life, fantastic life. And that isn't all. When he went to the cross, he took with him eight problem-solving devices on the front line of his soul and the most powerful love that ever existed. And with that powerful love and those problem-solving devices, when our sins were imputed to him, every one of them, he received the judgment of those sins without reaction. One reaction, one time, and there would have been no salvation. That's what Satan was pushing for. Billions and billions of sins. And not once did he fail. You don't think that soul love wasn't powerful? And he handled it all. And that's why we have this so great salvation. Every sin was judged on the cross. That's what we call substitutionary atonement. No, it doesn't say Christ died for us. It says Christ died as a substitute for us. For each one of us. That means our sins, past, present, and future, were judged on the cross. Therefore, we have the best opportunity in post-salvation experience for a quality of life that is absolutely fantastic. A quality of life suggested by David in the Psalm 37. And so the church age believer inherited the prototype spiritual life through the positional sanctification at the moment of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. We were, the Holy Spirit entered us in the union with Christ. And this is the true doctrine of the baptism of the Spirit, which occurs at the moment of salvation. And it provides equal opportunity and equal privilege for every believer to execute this absolutely fantastic and unique spiritual life. The only time in history, what is it? The love of God is the point of reference for the church age to sponsor the unique spiritual life of all human history. And the love of God as a point of reference sponsors the greatest life that has ever existed since mankind walked on the face of the earth. The prophecy of illustration, now this is not the interpretation, but the prophecy of illustration begins in Psalm 37, 29. And listen to it. The righteousness will inherit, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Interpretation, Israel receiving their land, their land covenant, all of their unconditional covenants at that point. Application, those believers who execute the unique spiritual life will rule the world with Jesus Christ for the last 1,000 years of history as we have noted. Psalm 37, 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. So there again, here's the winter believer. The righteous is the winter believer. He utters wisdom. And justice is always fairness. Psalm 37, 31. The Torah, that you, you have translated in your Bible as the law, Torah is the Old Testament Scripture and refers, it's the Jewish way of referring to the canon of Scripture. The Torah of God, the Word of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. And then for the rest of this concept, look at Psalm 37, 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you 
to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Interpretation, the fulfillment of the unconditional covenants to Israel. But it's a perfect illustration and application for the church age believer. He will exalt the winner believer to rule the world with Christ. They will be rulers of the world with Christ. When the wicked are cut off, and that is that day one of Operation Footstool that we have studied, we've already seen it, the wicked are cut off, you, church age believers in resurrection body, will see it, will be the beginning of a new age just before eternity is ushered in, and you will see it. And so, Heavenly Father, we are gracious, grateful for the fact that everywhere we turn in the Scripture, we see the principle of quality of life related to what our Lord has provided for us in grace. And that how long we live is not the issue. It's how we live as believers in Jesus Christ. How much doctrine circulates in that stream of consciousness. And therefore, may we be challenged in not worried or even thinking about dying or how long we're going to live. Because you have already decided the time, the matter, and the place of our death. And it's in your hands. But the only thing we need to decide is the quality of life that you have provided for us. Do we want it or do we not? Do we want to be miserable as long as we live? Or do we have a happiness far beyond anything the world can understand? And so, Father, may God the Holy Spirit challenge us with regard to these questions as we have noted them very briefly in this passage this evening. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.